Hello, I'm here with Steve Kaufman uh, from thelinguist.com. Is that correct? The Linguist? Yep, that's my blog. Yep. Thelinguist.com, and he's the co creator of Link, which is something right. I've talked about quite a bit on this channel. So thanks so much for joining my YouTube channel, Steve. I am very happy to be here. Great. So um, why don't you just uh, give us a little bit of a um, history of who you are, how you got involved in uh, the language learning community? Um, stuff like that. I'm sure most of my YouTuber uh, followers know who you are already. Okay. But... Well, uh, you know, I'm a 74-year-old grandpa here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And for most of my career, I was in the lumber business. <clears throat> I was briefly a, a diplomat for seven years. And as a mm -hmm. diplomat, I um, was sent to Hong Kong to learn Mandarin Chinese back in 1968. And I also served at the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo. And, of course, on my own, I learned Japanese while living in Japan. Mm -hmm. And during my career in the wood business, I learned a bunch of languages uh, that were useful to me. But it's perhaps the last 12 years or so that I got very keen on, on language learning, uh, starting with oh. learning Russian and then working on uh, the development of Link with my son, Mark. And mm -hmm. so I've, I've learned, actually, more languages in the last uh, 12 years than I learned... Uh, before the age of 60. Yeah, that's and fascinating. part of that, I got my YouTube channel, I got my blog, and of mm -hmm. course we have Link. So it's been a tremendous, uh, tremendously enjoyable uh, involvement for me in this whole language learning, uh, you know, world, to call yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, it's interesting for me to hear you say that you got uh, into language learning. I mean, you knew a few languages earlier in life, but you got really right. into it later because I hear a lot of people say I'm too old right. right well now I did have nine languages when I was you know whatever I was 55 60 when oh, okay. I wrote my book uh, because I had been you know I'd studied in France for three years mm -hmm. uh, and then I was sent to Hong Kong learned Mandarin lived in Japan and I'd been you know as a student in France I'd hit I'd been Spain so I, mm. I had acquired a fair number of languages and I think that is good for the brain, like it makes you more flexible. Sure. You're, in terms of the range of sounds that you can hear and eventually reproduce, in terms of your, you know, you're more comfortable with the way different languages use, you know, different word order, different structures to say things. Mm -hmm. I think the more languages you have, the more comfortable you are learning languages. Sure. Uh, but certainly after the age of 60, I didn't, I, if anything, I found it easier to learn now simply because there's so many more resources available via the internet and yeah. technology and, and, and link and, and all this other stuff. So I don't think uh, age is an obstacle. Right. Yeah. That's really encouraging to hear. So, uh, you had already spoken quite a few languages at the time when you started getting online and doing things oh, yeah. with link. Um, so yeah. how old were you when you started learning your first, uh, well, your second well, language? Yeah. So it's a little complicated because I was actually born in Sweden. Oh, ah, okay. And, and my parents are from Czechoslovakia. And then hmm. uh, when I was five, uh, the family moved to Canada, to Montreal. Sure. Okay. And of course, we had French at school. But, uh, you know, even though Montreal is, was the, in those days two thirds francophone, one third anglophone, there wasn't mm -hmm. much connection. And I couldn't really speak much French. Uh, Quebec, the province, and certainly the city of Montreal has changed a lot. Now, yeah. a lot of people are genuinely bilingual. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the case back then. Mm, okay. uh, and then I got very interested in French. So then I went to France, where I went to university for three years. So that was the first language where I went from kind of stumbling in the language, having had, you know, high school French, to where I was converted into someone who could, who was essentially fluent. Yeah. And as for my Swedish, I'd basically forgotten my Swedish, you know. Okay. As a five-year-old, you arrive in a new country, and I was with my friends, and I have no no recollection of transitioning from Swedish into English. I must have mm -hmm. spoken with an accent for the first few months, and then it was all English, and I could no longer speak Swedish. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Uh, I really love Montreal. It's one of my favorite places to go. Oh, good. To, yeah, I like it. It's yeah. great. Yeah, um, it's one of my favorite cities. I, I like the, the accents they have there in, in uh, the Quebecois French. I don't know why. Oh, yeah. But um, I mean, the Quebecois, they're their own people, right? They're yeah. not like the French. I mean, they share a lot in, the, you know, culture mm -hmm. and language, but they have their own personality and they're great people, fun-loving, and uh, sure. it's, it's a great city. Sure. It's really a great city. Yeah. It, it's interesting for me to hear you say that you went through schooling and especially living in a, a, a Francophone uh, province. 
Um, Because that sounds very similar to my experience. I took five years of Spanish learning, uh, mainly starting when I was in eighth grade all the way up through to my first year of college. (laughs) So six years, I guess, of Spanish. And I got to the end of that period and it was like I was minoring in Spanish and I could barely hold the conversation. Um, But it's just I didn't really know uh, the right ways to go about learning language. Exactly. And if you were an Anglophone in Montreal in the 50s, you lived in the western part of the city, which was all English speaking. All the stores were English speaking. You didn't watch French television or read anything in French and you had French at school. The only exposure to French was the classroom. Yeah. And the classroom is not if you're unless you're very motivated and you do a lot of stuff on your own. If you're just relying on the classroom, it's not a very effective place to learn a language. Yeah, I agree completely. I had, uh, I think I know one person who uh, went through Spanish classes in high school and came out to really being able to communicate in Spanish. Um, I think it's a help, you know, it's, uh, it, it was, you know, it was, yeah. it was a good background to have. Um, but until I moved to El Salvador, uh, all of that book knowledge, you know, how to conjugate verbs and all that kind of stuff, it wasn't able to help me live in the language or you know have experiences in the language exactly i mean but it's it's as you say it's not nothing i mean you do have all that exposure you had presumably little stories to read you know yeah uh, which weren't very interesting but you nevertheless you read them maybe you listened to some spanish so that gives you give you an advantage so when you arrived in el salvador you weren't starting from zero yeah Precisely. But uh, but the uh, I think a lot of those grammatical explanations once you are in that environment in El Salvador, very quickly you start using the language more or less correctly, and now the grammatical explanations don't matter anymore. Right. Uh, you know, whereas before you couldn't really remember them, and now you don't need them. So it, it's not that they're bad, but uh, eventually you have to get that get the language in you, the real language. Yeah. Exactly. I remember um, specifically, I don't know why, specifically with the verb decir, I remember always having to try to go through my verb conjugations in my mind and thinking, what is it, dije or dijo or is it diso or, di, you know, dizo or something like that with a Z or something. And for I remember for a while, for several months, I had to keep going through that, but eventually, I just had gone through that process so many times that it just came out naturally without having to think. I think the third person singular of the past tense for a number of Spanish verbs is difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because it's O here, E there, it's a little bit confusing. And if you try to remember it, if you try to picture the conjugation table in your mind and try to remember it, it's, it's just too difficult to do on the fly. But if you're down there and everybody's talking and words are flying at you a mile a minute and you're using them wrong sometimes, right sometimes, eventually that kind of settles down and you develop a, some habits in the language which are correct uh, without referring to the grammar rule or to the conjugation table. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, uh, if it's okay with you, about Link. Absolutely. Because sure. Um, I'm, sh- I'm sure you wouldn't mind because... I don't mind. I don't mind. I, I often say on my channel that it's one of my favorite resources. Um, specifically after I've reached, you know, after I've gone a little bit further um, right. into my language learning. Um, so it probably needs no introduction, but uh, would you like to just uh, ex- give a little explanation of Link? For those who haven't seen this before. Sure. So Link sort of came out of my experience of language learning. And then Mark, my son, was able to sort of conjure that up as a system and find people, programmers in Ukraine or in um, Korea or wherever. He's got a whole group of people that he coordinates. Most, we have some staff in the office, but mostly they're remote. And, and the gist of it is that uh, to get into a language, Initially, you need a lot of repetition. So I personally, in the last five or six languages I've learned, I go to my mini stories. Uh, Lots of high frequency verbs, lots of repetition, listen lots of times. Uh, Don't necessarily try to nail it down, but try to get at least a, you know, a toehold in the language. But thereafter, the big power of Link is that you can bring in audiobook, ebooks, you can bring in Netflix, you can bring in YouTube, you can bring in newspaper articles. And so you want to progress to where you're dealing with authentic, interesting content. 
So you're motivated by your interest in the content, not by your desire to improve in the language because it is a long road. Uh, once you get past that, you know, that first sort of steep climb where all of a sudden you can say something in the language and wow, look at me. And then to get to where you're actually genuinely fluent is actually a long road. And therefore you need to consume a lot of content, listening and reading and eventually speaking, but speaking on subjects of interest. And so if you don't have much vocabulary, you can't have an interesting conversation. If you have more vocabulary, you can understand what people are saying. You might stumble a bit in speaking, but you're getting all that m much more input again from, you know, genuine, authentic, interesting conversation. So to build you, to build a learner up to where you have listened enough, read enough, learned enough words and done it in a systematic way, that that's a big part of that moving across what some people call the desert where you feel you're not progressing. And so link is all about that. It's, the initial steep climb, many stories and, you know, getting words and reviewing them and listening. And then for that long road, enabling you to access a wide range of content that we have in link plus bringing stuff in from the internet. And there's a bunch of functionality. There's a bunch of statistics, uh, things that make it easier to look up words and phrases, save words and phrases, review words and phrases, see how many words you've read, see how many words you've learned. So that when you have those moments where you doubt yourself, you can say, well, no, actually I've learned all these words. Look at my page. There are fewer new words. There are more words that I've learned. I actually am, you know, progressing in the language because I think there are lots of moments of, of self doubt and frustration for language learners. They feel they're not getting anywhere. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one of the things I, I love about this method is that it's enjoyable. You know, it should be. You, yeah, you uh, you focus your learning around things that are already inherently interesting to you, and uh, and it's a lot better than you know Duolingo. The dog has an apple, or you, all the other ridiculous. Exactly. I mean, Duolingo is has its place, and it's it's fun for people, and uh, you get initial exposure to the language. But ultimately, we need a lot of words. Like, if our goal is fluency. We need a lot of words and you won't get it from those sort of canned phrases. And I shouldn't say too much because I haven't done a lot with Duolingo. I just did a little bit, but the opportunity to learn from anything you want, movies, TV shows, songs, newspaper articles, whatever, you know, uh, academic texts, uh, you know, cookbooks. So you're, you're actually dealing with stuff that sometimes is familiar to you. Certainly it's of interest to you. And so you're just consuming these things. And your language, you know, your ability is just is just growing. Yeah. So, yeah. There, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's in essence that's what it does. And I also like our conversation reports. If I have a session with a tutor, I get a report from the tutor with ten or fifteen phrases and and words that I didn't use properly. And then my typically my tutor in Persian or Arabic will record it for me, so I can go back in and study these lessons again and again. Six months later, I can go back and go through that lesson that I had with my tutor, listen to it while I'm preparing the dish, you know, uh, breakfast or, or whatever. So there's a lot there. It's, it's an, it's a, I find it, you know, very pleasing as a place to be for language learning. Sure. Yeah. And I actually want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, your tutoring sessions, but, mm -hmm. um, as just, as far as Duolingo, um, you, you're right. Duolingo has its place. And I, I sort of have mixed feelings about Duolingo. Um, I, personally have used a system where I kind of start off a language using Duolingo and kind of grammar, I don't want to say grammar heavy, but where I'm focusing on learning verb conjugations and things like that. But as quickly as possible, I want to get to a point where I can listen to podcasts and watch YouTube videos or, you know, read stories. Um, whether that's stuff that's designed for native speakers to consume or if it's designed for second language learners. Um, you know, graded readers and, and things like that. Um, so I, I, I don't, you know, there's different schools of thoughts and I don't want to, uh, to, to claim to go all the way with one or the other. Um, I know you get some people who say, never learn grammar. Um, and I don't, well, I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, the, the issue is, so do we want to speak more or less correctly? I think everyone would like to speak accurately. Okay. So to that extent, we are concerned about, you know, 
speaking the way the language is described in the grammar rules. The question is, how do you get there? And it's been my experience that, yeah, I like to have a bit of an overview when I start into a language. Uh, I don't think I'll remember much of the overview. Yeah, that's very true. And uh, so there's sometimes when you have the impression, like how many times have I looked at a conjugate, conjugation table or at the declension table? And it, it, I think I'm learning something while I'm looking at it, but in fact, I'm not. It has very little impact. Uh, it's not zero, but it's limited. Uh, at best, it helps you to notice certain, certain things because some things we simply don't notice. So does it help to look at the third person singular of the you know, past tense in Spanish every now and again in a conjugation table? Yeah, it probably does, but it doesn't ensure that you'll get it right the next time. So to me, grammar light, when you're curious, look something up. When you're getting started in a language, get a bit of an overview. But by far the greatest emphasis has to be on getting the language in you and letting the brain get used to the language. Yeah. And the sort of deliberate study, and one thing I certainly do not do is any exercises, tests, or drills. I refuse to do them. Okay. It's, it's annoying. Uh, you're going to get them wrong. And in so many textbooks, they start out in chapter one with a test. I've, I've taught you, you know, the names of, uh, you know, house, bird, whatever. So then they show you a picture of a car and, and you got to link up which ones. I don't want to do any of that stuff. I just want to hear the language. I just want to hear the language and or read it. And, and I think that's more effective. And with enough exposure, the brain will get used to the language. Uh, but there are things the brain won't notice. And so there's nothing wrong with reading grammar at various stages of your learning. But you have to be realistic in terms of what you're going to what you're going to achieve by by reading. The grammar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's very similar to what I would say on, the, on that subject. Um, I do enjoy I'm kind of a nerd. I went to school for linguistics and I, I like grammar, so it's fun to me. You know? Sure. Um, but I, do I remember it all the time? No, not unless I'm getting practice using it. Um, An ideal type of grammar, which I, I've got a Russian book like this, is where the book is written in Russian, so I have to be advanced, advanced enough. Explanations in Russian, and then there's 10 examples. Like examples are much more powerful than any explanation. Sure. You know, if they say, the, 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 this is used in this way when this situation of course, but not in this other situation, all that stuff, limited impact on the brain. But if you yeah. see 10 examples of situation A and 10 examples of situation B, and you go back again and look at it, it starts to help the brain, you know, get a sense of, of how the, the language works in those two different situations. Okay. Seems like maybe now we're back. I was getting you for a while, but it was real yep. choppy. Okay. All right. Um, gosh, that got me off track. Now, what were we talking about? Uh, grammar drills? And... About grammar. Yeah. Grammar, the role of grammar. Sure. Um, yeah, I, there have for sure been times uh, where I'll be in a conversation with someone and I'll think, Oh shoot! How do I conjugate that verb? And uh, sometimes I can think back to the grammar book and see the chart in my mind with the conjugations or the declensions or whatever. And uh, I think that does it for sure reinforces it when I'm in a conversation and I have to use it. But I, I agree with you. Um, it's a lot better to go through and uh, get a lot of exposure to the language and use it and all of that studying um, is more of a complement or a supplement to uh, the actual use of the language. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned uh, tutoring sessions with a tutor. Right. What does a typical tutoring session look like uh, for you? Okay, for me, the most typical is that I just get on and we talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, the good tutors are able to find subjects that I can talk about. Sure. And uh, as I progress in the language, we move from the weather in Vancouver to the political situation in Iran or something. Uh, when I'm normally, I like to wait until I have three, five thousand words on link before I get involved with the tutor because otherwise I don't understand what they're saying and I don't have many words and I we have a very very limited conversation. What I have done when I was at an early stage, say in Persian and Arabic, where the script is so difficult, is to read 
with the tutor. I would never do that if it's in the Latin alphabet or even the Cyrillic alphabet, which is not that difficult. But when I was struggling to get a, a toehold on, on the Arabic and certainly the Persian, like at least with the Arabic on link, we have text to speech, but on Persian, there's no text to speech. So just to make sure I was reading properly, uh, I started out with our mini stories. I love our mini stories. And so I'd read some of the mini stories in Persian, let's say, and there are questions in the mini stories. So then the tutor would ask me questions similar to the questions in the mini stories. So I would have the words so I could reply. Uh, but that would be for the first five sessions. And then once I progress, then we start. We just, it's free flowing conversation, basically. No preparation on my part, no preparation on the tutor's part. The tutor has to follow up with um, a list of, say, 10 or 15 words and phrases, which she then records. So I get about a five minute recording, which I can review, you know, at various times in the future. Yeah. And you mentioned the mini stories. Can you explain a little bit of what that's like? Yeah, I mean, this is not something I invent invented. There's a fellow called A.J. Hogue, mm -hmm. who is uh, an American, a very, very good English language teacher. And even I think he didn't invent it. It came from this whole uh, uh, TPRS, or uh, Teaching Proficiency Through Reading and Storytelling. Like, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of people who came up with this. There's First of all, there's the point of view story, and then there's what they, what's known as circling questions. Mm -hmm. So... You say, the point of view is that, you know, I go to the store, I buy this, I die, do, do that, then I go home. Sure. Uh, then it says, I went to the store, I bought this, I went home. Mm -hmm. So two stories with two different points of view, which could be a different person. It could be a different tense. Uh, and so you essentially have the same vocabulary in two different situations. Yeah. Then this is followed by what's known as circling questions. And the, object, the, the uh, intent of the questions is not to test you on your comprehension. I think comprehension questions are a very, very bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, because whatever I don't understand is my business. I don't want to have it pointed out that I didn't understand what I was listening to. Right. However, the circling questions say, okay, Steve went to the store. That's a statement. You hear mm -hmm. it and you read it. Steve went to the store. Did Steve go to the restaurant? Mm -hmm. No. Steve went to the store. So again, the same vocabulary now repeats, repeats three times. Sure. It's put into a question form. So you see how simple questions are, are uh, you know, uh, uh, produced. Or where did Steve go? Well, Steve went to the store. So you could have a, a question word, where, why, when, who. Mm -hmm. Or you could simply, did he, you know, type of question. And so for every, and these, these 60 mini stories are built based on the most frequently used verbs in the language. And typically, if the word go, come, get, wish, need are high frequency in English, they'll be high frequency in Spanish, high frequency in Arabic. Those are the things that we most often want to express as verbs. And also, all of the most common conjunctions. Although, on the other hand, however, instead of, all of these things show up. Sorry. I th we got, we yeah, got, we kind of got, yeah, uh, that's happened a few times now. Uh, yeah. Do you find acquiring verbs to be more important than nouns or other parts of speech? Yeah. If you want to speak, verbs, I think, are, are super important. You're forever want to say, need to say, hope to, plan to, go, come, give, take. Those are very, very important. Whether you go, you know, a book, you know, a tree, a car, a house, other nouns, you get those eventually anyway. I find that the verbs are absolutely key. Verbs and then the connecting words. If you have verbs and connecting words, you're kind of on your way, at least insofar as getting to speaking. Now, when you are reading, I, can't, I think they're more all of equal value when you're listening and reading. But when you want to express something, then I think the verbs are really important to have a good handle on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can always get around with some of that circumlocution, mm -hmm. finding different ways of saying things. But yeah, the verbs are very important. So um, since you bring that up, passive understanding of inputs can be a lot easier than being able to produce output in the language. Right. How do you make the jump from being able to understand what you're reading or listening to to actually being able to 
you know, be a part of the conversation. At some point, you have to start speaking. And if you have invested enough time in good comprehension and in a decent vocabulary, these words and phrases are bouncing around in your head. And it's always, for me, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit like jumping in the lake and you don't know if the water's cold or not. So I'm a bit, every time I, there's a certain amount of trepidation, right? My first online discussion in Persian or Arabic or Turkish, how's it going to, because I haven't done it before, right? I've just been listening and reading and it always works out. I mean, the first one, it's amazing what you're able to put out. Uh, you're struggling, you're searching, you're trying to hard to understand what the other person is saying and, and you just gradually get better. You gradually get better. But I would far rather start speaking from a base of a good passive vocabulary, good, you know, some level of familiarity with the language. As I say, three to 5,000 words on link. At least I have a chance in that situation uh, to, to engage with a tutor. If I don't, if I'm starting from zero, what can we say? Hello, my name is, and then, and I won't even understand what the other person is saying. So, so I, uh, I just, uh, you know, as I say, I, I used to wait longer. But I feel that the mini stories enable me to start speaking sooner. I waited like, must have been nine months with Russian, six months mm. with Czech. Okay, wow. We didn't have many yeah. stories. That's now not with the, the mini stories, mm. within a month, Persian, Turkish, Arabic. I was on with the tutor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I first started learning Spanish, Spanish was really the first language that I uh, wanted to learn to fluency. And um, I, I really started pushing on the Benny Lewis approach, you know, oh, yeah. start speaking from day one. And uh, it was, um, how would I say, I think it was good for me because I was in a Spanish speaking country and there were just times oh, where I, yes. I had to. Oh, sure. You know? If you're there, yeah. yeah. And it, I had a lot of comprehensible input by being in the country and I had already had relationships with people and they, you know, you, you can kind of use, you know, hand motions and they can point and do things to get you to understand what's going on. Um, but one, sure. of, one of the best advice that I think someone gave me before uh, I went to El Salvador, uh, someone who had already lived overseas, they said, uh, Aaron, the best advice I can give you for learning Spanish is just don't be afraid to look like a fool or don't be embarrassed of making mistakes because you're right. going to mess up. And if you wait to speak until you know you're going to be 100% sure that you're speaking correctly, you're just not going to speak. And then you're not going to get any practice and you'll never learn. And, um, you know. I mean, you're never going to be perfect. Yeah. You're right. always going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. If you want to be sure that you're not going to look like a fool, then you shouldn't learn another language. Yeah. Like, it yeah. just goes with the territory. You are going to stumble. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in, I learned Japanese in Japan. I was living there, but I still invested a lot of time in deliberate reading and listening. Yeah. Yeah. I was engaging with Japanese people in the stores, eventually even people I was dealing with in business. But I was motivated to get my vocabulary up, get my comprehension up so that I, c I could actually have meaningful exchanges. Because the more meaningful the exchange, because the native speaker always has a much bigger vocabulary than you have. So the, your passive vocabulary is your first line of defense. You got to understand what they're saying. If you don't understand what they're saying, y you know, you can't communicate. You can struggle to answer. But if you don't understand what they're saying, that's, that's, I find that very intimidating. I don't find it intimidating to not produce the language correctly. That's okay. I'm not a native speaker, but to have to always say, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Could you say that again? That is very bad. So, uh, but even if you go to the country from scratch, you start speaking from day one. In fact, what you're relying on is input. You're hoping that you can trigger some output from these people and that somehow your brain is going to get used to what you're hearing. The better way to do it is then to go back home and read and listen so that that actually you can sort of build yourself up so that you aren't having to ask all the time. What was that? What was that? What was that? So yeah. Yeah, for sure. And uh, a lot of times I would fall into the trap of going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I have no idea what they're saying, you know, and I've, I've heard different people have theories about, well, should you stop them and ask them to repeat or, you know, is it... <laughs> 
But for me, it was See, just the thing is the thing is you're you're speaking to someone else. Okay, that someone else may be your friend, may be a teacher, in which case they have the patience to humor you. But if you're just talking to someone that you actually have a need to communicate with, and especially if that person speaks English, and you're having to ask all the time, what was that? What was that? I beg your pardon. That conversation isn't going anywhere. Yeah. So you're really you're really relying on sort of a te even if it's your friend, it's kind of a teacher student relationship. Mm -hmm. Whereas you want to get to an equal relationship, and to to have an equal language relationship, you have to understand what they're saying. And you have to have enough words to even stumbling kind of get your meaning across. And it takes deliberate effort to build that up, even if you're in the country, even if you're speaking from day one. Uh, and I'm sure Benny, when he's in the country, he goes back home and he plows through his books so that the day two, he's better prepared than he was day one. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've had to find a balance for myself, too, with it. At first, I was all gung ho about speak from day one, and you know I got some good results from that. But then other languages where I wasn't living in the country, you know sometimes I would find a language partner and I'd say, all right, we're going to do half an hour in French, and then we're going to do half an hour in English, and you get to the half hour of French, and it's like, bonjour, I don't know what else to say. So, oh, yeah. so um, I, I there is two there for sure is two sides of the coin to um. Right. Establishing your level uh, before engaging in a conversation. But wherever you have the opportunity to use a language, I never hesitate. Like even when I didn't have much Persian, if I ran across an Iranian here in a store in Vancouver, I would go at them with my limited Iranian. I mean, that's absolutely no reason why not to. Oh, yeah, yeah I agree completely. Um, how, how much of your early tutoring sessions do you do in English? In English? Yeah. I mean, do you do any English or do you... Oh, do I, I presume tutor English, you mean, at Link? When you first start tutoring with a tutor, presumably... Oh, yeah, you... no, no English, no English. So you, oh, no. you start with... Absolutely. With, with no, I want to um... just... I don't want to... If I'm paying a tutor and I'm paying mm -hmm. them, whether they're Link tutors or italki tutors, mm -hmm. I want... I do a lot of listening. When I get on with a okay. tutor, okay. I want to speak. And I want to speak the language, be yeah. it Turkish or be it occasionally they might help me out with um, with English, but I don't want too much of it because I'm going to mm -hmm. get a list of, say, 10 or 15 words and phrases that I had trouble with, and yeah. I will learn them there, and they'll give me the recording, and I'll learn it. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically, if they give me uh, the translation of a word, I'm going to forget it anyway. Sure. So I really don't want it. I want to only target language. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Greek, okay. Romanian, whatever it was. Target language. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never started uh, a language just speaking the target language, but there for sure came a point in my... I just started learning Thai last year, and there for sure came a point uh, while I was learning Thai that I'm like, okay, I don't want to pay you to go through a textbook with me anymore. I want to I wanna speak the Thai with you, or we're going to have to find a new tutor. Right. You know? Yeah, um, and speaking of Thai, um, so you've learned a few different scripts over the years. Right. The Cyrillic yep. script, um, you speak Mandarin, I think, or you can read uh, uh, Chinese, yeah, Japanese. Yeah, read and speak Mandarin, Japanese, Korean. Yeah. Yeah. For, for me, learning the Thai alphabet was, you know, as far as tones and grammar and everything, it, nothing was harder than learning the Thai alphabet for me. No doubt. Um, no doubt. What do you do when you need to learn a whole different writing system? Well, my most recent experience is with Arabic mm -hmm. and Persian, which is essentially the same writing system. I mean, you just have to put in the time. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to kind of gradually learn what the different letters stand for. But we're so used to reading in our own alphabet. Like yeah. we see our own alphabet. It's meaning, thing. Mm -hmm. You're reading in another uh, writing system. It's very hard. It takes a long time for the brain to get used to it. Yeah, and it just—it's just a strain all the time, all the time. And there, there, are, there is no shortcut. You just have to read and read and read. At first, you figure out what the value of the letters is, or values for each letter is, and then you slowly read and slowly. And I mean, one thing you can do at Link is you can set your um, flashcards to a dictation, and then. Mm. save words and eventually phrases and then you can try and type 
uh, as it began, you'll get all the letters wrong, and eventually you start getting more and more of them right. But and I did all those things for Greek and for uh, for uh, even for Hangul and for Arabic. But it's still a long road. Like that's and yet it's very important to me. Reading is a big part of language learning. So that's a major investment, major, major investment. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people who don't want to do it, who just want to have the ability to casually, uh, you know, banter away in the language, which is fine. But I want to get to where I can understand political podcasts in Arabic or Persian, uh, going through a series now on the history of Iran. Yeah. And so there's words there. I got to be able to read and I'm reading. Now I'm reading in Persian on the history of Iran and I'm happy, but it's, it's a long road. It's a long road. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, I think I'm going to end the uh, video here. Okay. Thanks well, so much. For, yeah, yeah, me too. So um, that's Steve Kaufman, uh, thelinguist.com. I'll put links to uh, some of his uh, websites and, and channels and stuff uh, down yeah, below. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, and uh, look forward. And if there are comments, uh, you know, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, um, I'll leave a... Uh, comment section i mean there's a comment section below for people to to leave comments and, okay uh, all right Super. So, okay thank you very much thank you